All right, I think we're good to go. Hello, everybody. I'm Tanya, your host of Co-Creative No Codes Office Hours. Welcome to episode number 116. We're here with members Brittany, Thomas, and Jay. We're going to get started in just a moment, but if this is your first time tuning into Office Hours, we do this every day of the week, Monday through Friday, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 10 a.m. Pacific time, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And what Office Hours is, is we welcome our members to come onto the Zoom sessions, which we broadcast live on Facebook and send a key to YouTube. And they can ask us any question they want regarding Bubble. Um, they can bring us a Bubble bug, a feature request, anything that they want regarding Bubble is welcome here. And if you would like to join us for a complimentary session to see what Office Hours is all about and how quickly we can help you get unstuck with bubble bugs and such, you can go ahead and email us at team at co-creativenocode.com and Kim and I will get you some credentials and you can come on and meet the crew. All right, I think Jay was here first, so we'll, we'll get started with you. Okay. How's it going? It's going good. Um, I've got... Uh, Hold I, on, um, did you click live on Facebook? Yeah, we never stopped being live. So our oopsie is going to be on live Facebook. So. <laughs> okay, Sorry, all right, you go ahead. Okay. <laughs> okay, can you guys see? Yep, I can see. So right here, it should say Essex, Maryland. It should say city state. And I've had it working and it's not working now. I don't know why I didn't change anything. Well. I didn't change anything on the page, but I changed a ton in the back end. I don't think that's it though. I can't get to the tab, give me a second. Okay. So that looks like, uh, that looks like this. It's just an extract. I, I've been trying to get it to work. So right now it just says extract city, but originally it said extract city, comma, extract state. Um, but none of these are working. It doesn't matter what I put in. And I am so mystified as to why. So I took a look at the data type and, and I uh, double checked to make sure that the field was a, uh, geographic field. What about in your database? Well, no, I mean, did you check, did you check your, your data to yes. make sure that that field is filled out? So it says like, there's an address in Maryland. That's... Let me double check. Let me double check because, you know, <laughs> I ended up having to make huge, uh, well, huge, lots of changes to the database um, since we last spoke. And sure. um, it's certainly possible that I screwed something up. So that one is empty and that would explain that. You have location text though. I do, but that one it won't extract from. Okay. Uh, which I don't think it should be able to. Let's see if that saves. Well, you should be able to look in your in your database to see if it's saved. Oh, I just want to see if it displays. I should I use the word incorrectly. Okay. All right, it didn't happen, so it probably didn't save. I should have checked that first. Nope. Yeah, the location's not saving. Okay, so um, let's make sure that you're, uh, and you can do this off screen, so stop sharing, but I would go and double check and make sure that your um, Google Maps API key is working. And um, so when you say by working, I mean, do I have the right information in Bubble and does it look set up properly in Google? Right, and making sure that you have a card on file because a lot of times people will forget to put a card on file and then they'll just stop randomly working. Like once you've run out oh. of your, your free trial, um, it doesn't mean that they need to charge your card. It's just like a timed trial sometimes. 
Yeah. So it's like a three month thing. So it might be that you set it up three months ago or something and it's like over three months. And so one way or the other, they want to start, like they want to make sure you have a card on file. Um, another thing is, is when you initially go to do that, that saving, because you, you definitely at some point had access to that information. You could also save it in separate, um, in separate fields. Like you could have city state saved separately from, like you could use that extract function to save it to the database, like the city and state, and then reference that directly. So, you know, I've gone back and forth with all the location stuff, as you probably remember many times, mm -hmm. and I'm extremely uh, annoyed by the whole thing because it worked in the beginning and it didn't work. Um, in terms of getting them to save their city or state, I mean, I tried doing that during the sign up process and it got No, I don't mean having them do it. I mean, one, go ahead and get the location thing working again, but then maybe um saving it separately in the database right but i try the only place i could really make sense to do that is you know in in the sign up process even if they're not doing it directly that there's a and you know an action that says you know save result of whatever extract city you know what i mean yeah i do so that i'm, I'm not like, saying you have to it was just a suggestion to so right. like i'm just I, I would saying like something to work like that way yeah <laughs> Like, I mean, I, I personally would probably like save it separately and then refer to it directly instead of using the extract function on the, on the same page. Yeah. I think that like, would be better. Then it only has one chance to fail instead of a chance to fail over and over. <laughs> um, and then my other question was, I don't have anything to show on the screen for this, but, um, when uh, we spoke a couple weeks, uh, a little bit ago, um, um, oh God, I want to say uh, your new partner suggested that I do a search index field to make that okay. search better. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, so my question is like, it makes sense when it's text comma text, but when I'm saving like name comma you know, inches of spacing, comma, inches, 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 or whatever it is, how does, like, is that gonna work? Because it's just text and a string of numbers separated by commas. How does it know that height minimum is height minimum? No, so I, I mean, he was just doing it for the, the, the search, right? So yeah. like you, like when you're, you're talking about like if they type in 55 or whatever, how is it going to know that it's supposed to be minimum? It's not. It's going to find all of the records that have 55 in it, right? So if what you remember is 55 and you type 55, it'll pull up all of the records that have 55 in it somewhere in the mm -hmm. text, right? So it's 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 just a search, like it's a search field. It's not um, it's not filtering down. If they wanted to find the record by filtering, then you use your filters and not your text search. Uh, I guess I'm going to have to be looking at Mealy search again, because that won't work. <laughs> Super frustrating. What do you mean that won't work? Well, you could have a plant that's 12 inches high, or you could have a plant that's 12 inches wide. And let's right. say you want a ground cover or something that's 12, that's 12 inches wide, but it can't be more than six inches high then you don't want that 12 inch high plant showing up in your search. Well, you're like, okay. What was the original thing that you were trying to solve for? That um, filtering. So you see like our soon to be huge database of plants. And mm -hmm. let's say you want a two foot tall, one foot wide blue plant that blooms in May in your zone. So I've got that filter that you helped me with a ton. Mm -hmm. set up so you can filter through those characteristics or those attributes and you can only see things that would work for you right so the filters don't work well i had to hide a lot of them because they just weren't working what wasn't working was that if there was a um a record that didn't have everything filled out like if it didn't have the height minimum but it had the height maximum 
then nothing at all would show up in the filter. Nothing, like not just that record, no records. Oh, okay. So I, unless, so I was trying to just fudge it and put in zeros when there was nothing. But that, I mean, and that, you know, it worked, but it did it work from a user standpoint. It doesn't give you what you're looking for. It just gives you more than you're looking for. Right. So, okay. So, yeah, I mean, I, d I don't know that Miley search is going to solve your problem. I don't either. Okay. So maybe let's ask Pablo again. I think Pablo will be here on Wednesday. If not, Justin will be here on Wednesday. But the this idea that you're having to make fake data in order to get anything to show up probably means we just have the filter set up wrong. Okay. Like there's probably a better way for us to set up those filters. I know we've worked on them before, but yes. Um, but yeah, you shouldn't be having to enter fake data to get the results you want from a search. Yeah. I don't know how I guess to tell it to ignore. And then the answer that Pablo gave you was specifically to be able to search for any record that has anything that you type in that search yeah. to come up, right? Which then you could filter down from, right? Because you could fill, you could start with the with the search field and then filter down further from there. Hmm, okay. I'll have to think about that. I think that then, then you've put, you've given the user the kind of challenging task of looking at an input and thinking, I want something two feet high. Do I type in two apostrophe? Do I type in two F-E-E-T? Do I type in two F-T? Do I spell no, out? No, but like, two? I'm, yeah, that's what the filters are for. No, I don't think Pablo was saying don't use the filters. I think he was just solving, like he he was solving something out of context. Like he didn't have the context that you were trying to filter down by something very specific. He was thinking, okay, we want to search for keywords basically. And, and how can you get everything to show up that has is referencing something specific like some specific text. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll wait till Wednesday and I'll go through and see um, see if, uh, you know, I'll be prepared for Wednesday. I'll have my questions all set up. Sounds good. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hey, Reese, how's it going? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Good, thanks. We're going to move. Let's see here. Um, I'm going to go with Thomas first. Thomas, what did you bring for me today? Um, I, was just, I thought Brittany was going to go. Do you mind actually? Just oh, no, I don't mind. Brittany, are you okay. ready? Brittany? I'm sorry, I had to step away. You, you can go to the next place and I'll be right back. Okay, Reese, do you have anything for me? Uh, not right now, thank you. No, you just have beta users. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, no, it was uh, nice to finally, you know, see something happening. So, um, yeah, it's going good. Awesome. Jay, it's back to you. Got already? I mean, I just chatted. <laughs> I know, right? Where, where did you find your beta users? Uh, my girlfriend has uh, a lot of friends who are, um, they're, they're, they're gamers and um, they've got like a, a real tight knit group. Um, so we, I just, we just got them to come around and uh yeah, I gave them some money to play with and they just started playing. <laughs> awesome. How are you capturing their experiences? Are they giving you feedback directly? Are you are you watching what they how what are you doing? I'd love to know. Yeah, so I mean that was the point of getting them around because I wanted to see their interactions with the, the the app and see how uh you know how and what they did. 
and immediately it started breaking. Um, so just little little bits and pieces, resolutions on people's phones, uh, not matching up seems to be a big one. Uh, you know, on some people's phones, the, the responsiveness seems to work and then other times it just seems to break. So I sort of just uh, took note of everything and, and uh, yeah, just, just got feedback on it. And I've been just making little incremental changes. That is super exciting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's really, really good. Um, it's, uh, it's late here now, so they had to take off, but uh, there'll be more to carry on with tomorrow. That's awesome. Yeah. We did have a question in the Facebook group. So if, um, I think I'll go ahead and take Paul Salvage's question. He was asking about doing searches that don't exclude, but rather include. And so the answer here, Paul, is you use a merge and I'll demonstrate on our sandbox. So the question is he's he's got a table of experts and, and then each has a list of countries under the expert data type, whatever that is. And he wants a to use a multi-drop where a user can select a number of countries and then find all of the experts in, in um, each of those countries. So he wants an inclusive list rather than an exclusive list using filtering. And the answer here is, let me think through it. And Paul, the answer is there's not a simple, like there's not an intuitive way to do it. It's tricky. Um, you're adding... Yeah, I, I got tripped up the last time I tried to answer this question. I don't know if you guys remember. Thomas probably does. But you're gonna search for experts and then the constraint has, probably has something to do with overlaps or something like that intersects with. Let's just try. See if we can figure it out. So I'll come here and I'll have a repeating group. And we'll go with tallies. And then the data source, do a search for a tally. And then I probably don't have, yeah, all right, so. I have a drop down. Actually, I'll have a multi drop down. Dynamic choices. Tally. And then doesn't need to be that long. So I'm wondering how we would know how many to do. That's the part that I'm confused on here. Because essentially you would do one search constrained by one country. And then the way I have it in my head that we would do it is merge that search 
with another search. So do merged with, and then do another search for tallies, right? This would be like experts and that's constrained to the second country. And then you just keep adding merged with and at the end you would put um, probably unique elements. That way you wouldn't have duplicates in your list. And then you could show that in a repeating group. Um, but the question is if you have a drop down where you can select multiple different countries, you don't know how many countries they're going to select. Um, so I'm not clear on that, but I'm sure there is an answer. I'll ask, I'll see if I can find an answer for you, Paul. We'll give it a shot. All right, let's see. Um, Thomas or Brittany, are you ready yet? I am if she, if Brittany isn't. Yeah, you can go ahead, Thomas. Okay, yeah, I'll be quick. So I'll just share for the sake of sharing. Uh, we had a conversation last time about the about um, things being created, obviously mm -hmm. independent workflows. So I'm still having a bit of an issue. And I think it's because I made some changes, but every once in a while, the canvases aren't uh, filling out. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking it's working now, but sometimes it's not. And even when I refresh it, it still has a little bit of a bug. Is that normal or is that just because referencing isn't occurring properly? Um, no, it wouldn't be normal for it to work sometimes and not others, with the exception of needing some kind of pause or delay inserted. Sure. Okay. Yeah, I think it may have been. I'll have to go back in there. The reason I, I still have all the uh, the referencing as, as current page instead of parent group, as you suggested, but it's only because I'm going to convert everything into a reusable element. Okay. So that's going to... I'm going to have to do all that. Second question is for Jay. Jay, did you end up hearing back from Cameron about uh, the whole API? No, research? I never heard back from him. I'm thinking I want to just, I'm just going to sh shoot my shot at that and <laughs> bug somebody you know, from the Miley search team until I figure it out. Because it'd be useful to know. There's only one person selling it on Fiverr. That's crazy. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Has anyone looked into what was the other one we were talking about? Was it cheat layer or was that a web scraper? Or was oh, that cheat cheat layer is the web scraper, and he's coming on on Friday onto office really? hours to show us. Yeah, it's very cool. You want to see what I was able to do? Yes. <laughs> Let's see if I can if I can find it. Hang on a second. I gotta. I gave it to my VA and I asked her to check it out and see if she could learn it. <laughs> so if I went to cheat layer here so what i did was i and then i also created a google sheet so i created two scripts one with him and then one on my own so this is the one I did in my demo with the with um, I think his name is Arun or something like that. And then this is the second one that I created all by myself to go through and get grab all of the links, which is like a common use case, I'm guessing. So on the um, here, using the cheat layer extension, you can see this is the one that I created this is the script that i've already created on this page so cheat layer demo pavli to g sheets i'd never used pavli before but it was super simple to get started with pavli by the way what is pavli so pavli is like a zapier or integromat but apparently oh, okay. it's like less expensive and it was really easy like took me two seconds to sign up using uh google and then um and then immediately make a workflow. It just was really, really simple. And so from here, let's edit this. So it pulls up, this is the code. I generated the GPT-3 code, like the first one by saying whatever he told me to, H2 or whatever. 
the second one I did, where's the second one? Cards import. Yeah, this looks like it's old. Let me stop running this one. Okay. So remove that and then add here. And if I wanted to start a new one and just go here. Anyway, he's going to come and show us. And I told him, and he said, well, maybe one of your members will have something for like, is a good demonstration and I thought maybe you could prepare something for him to like show you how to do using cheat layer J. So, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah because it was really simple. So you were using like, it to get the contents of a CSV document into your sheets or I don't understand what you're trying to do. I was trying so here let me let me generate some GPT-3 code. So find all links on the page and send to G sheets using probably. So then if I come here and I just delete all of this. Let's say link. And then I finish logging in to Pathway. Where was I here? Access now. So you can see I have these two. So this is the links one that I have. Copy. And then come back here. It's generated the, the JavaScript for me. This is what I have to replace is this word here with my with my webhook URL. Right there. And then I just say. Run. And then I come back here. And if it's working, it will just start. You can see that it was working before, but probably did something wrong. Let's see here. Nope, not getting it to work. But yeah, he'll be here on Friday to show us exactly how to do it. I could use another tutorial in terms of getting it exactly right. I guess I could try. He did teach me how to do this part. Oh, maybe that's why it's not working. It's my tasks are consumed. So let's see what's the upgrade fee. 100 tasks per month. I've already done 100 tasks per month. That's crazy. So I wonder, is a task like the, that entire, like I want to scrape a big website, let's say. Do you think that's one task or do you think every page or every line is a task? I'm not sure, but you can ask, um, yeah. like you, you can ask him and yeah. And it works with, it works with any web hook. So technically on your own, um, if you were sending it into bubble, you just make your own endpoint and then it doesn't cost anything to send it to that endpoint because you don't need you don't have to use um i'm using pably but i'm only using pably as the intermediary between uh the website the plugin or the extension here and this google sheet but your bubble app has its own um if you go in here to the API, you can create your, you can enable your data API and you can have any of your data here, you can expose an endpoint to it, right? So you just replace OBJ probably with like Canvas here. So as the object, 
and then you can write into your own database. You don't have to go through um, Pavly instead. Um, this script is will send to the endpoint that you tell it to. When you were trying to set up your tests here in Sheet Layer, did you find mm -hmm. um, a lot of resources like communities, forums, videos? So he has a, a bunch of examples already and he's using the examples like people asking him questions as, as the fodder for making these examples to show how to do it. Um, there's, I joined, there's also a Facebook group that you can join where you can ask your questions. So yeah, there's, he's, he's supporting it. I, I get the feeling it's just one person right now, but he's yeah. supporting it himself and he's trying to grow it and there, and there, he's already invested. Somebody's coming in to clean up the interface to make it look nicer and, um, to help out. So, yeah. But that's why I asked him if he'd be interested because he's taking his time. Even if you don't buy it, you can get a one-on-one -on -one session with him. So I just said, well, why don't you just come on office hours and show it, like several people at the same time how it, how it works? Because um, certainly a huge thing for people who are creating bubble apps would be to scrape data for their database. If I could get it to work, I would be so happy and I would go ahead and buy the freaking lifetime membership. Because I started looking at now that it's getting toward first frost here on the East Coast and Australia, it's getting toward last frost. <laughs> I'm thinking about all the stuff I need to scrape in Australia. I did some searches this morning and I've got a lot of records to capture and I've got people doing, you know, me and people are doing a lot of it, but it would be so much better if we could just stick at the people out of it and then we could just check data and upload it or even upload it automatically. I don't think that'll happen. <laughs> That's just too much to wish for. <laughs> yeah. Well, I see I mean, it next to if this, then that too. I wonder, I mean, you could do some powerful things in the back. What I'm thinking would be great would be when I build Seed Shopper, the comparison shopping tool I wanna do, then it could go out, it could check all the major catalogs that we already are using, you know, like Burpee or Park, see what the price is and if the price doesn't match what we have in our database in, in bubble then it could update that record and that way i wouldn't have to update eighteen thousand records yep there are lots of lots of possibilities for automation so possibly it's it's definitely possible to to check things and compare things so not sure We'll see what he says on Friday. Um, when I know that other people are uh, waiting, and uh, but when you have a chance, come back to me because I remembered another big question. <laughs> gotcha. Brittany, are you ready? Yes. All right. I will okay. stop sharing. So um, I'm just going off of my list here, and I want to um, integrate a way for users to verify their email address upon signing in so mm -hmm. um that would be the sign in login pop-up so i don't know how to do that portion of it all right um so it has to do with your what your sign up button so go ahead and go into the workflow for that and then sign the user up and then click the checkbox, send an email to confirm the email. Where is it? Oh, wow. Well. Yeah, that was pretty easy. Confirmation. And then you have to decide where, what the confirmation page is that you're going to use. Um, I'm not sure if you can just use, I guess whatever page you choose, you probably, there's probably some sort of workflow on it. I can check. Uh, so what um, what does it mean by a confirmation page? Um, so this is like when they send an email, they're going to have a link in the email that the person has to click, and that's going to have a token, so that it it will mark the person as confirmed in your um in your database. So this is the confirmation pages. Where do you want them to go when they after they click okay. that link? Oh, okay, okay. So it has to be a link back into your app. Okay. 
So that will be, I will have to, um, that will be this if it's a business owner, but that's only when. So would I have to make two different um, workflows for this? Why? Because, so I have two separate types of users. So once so they, I would I wouldn't I wouldn't make two different ones. What I would do is I would make a page specifically okay. in your app okay. as like the almost like a blank page that then the workflows um that verifies them, but then it sends them to the correct page based on okay. who they are. Gotcha. Okay. So I will remove what happened okay I think in Canvas, we just call it like email verification or something like that. Okay. Let's see. And so. So once I do that. After they are sent to the confirmation page, then what? Like, I don't know if I quite understand what I'm doing. Yeah, it's just gonna, there's gonna be a token that uh, that they attach to that link, which is just like a URL parameter that's just gonna tell you here, I'll share my screen and we can just okay. test it if you want. So make a verify. to account, sign the user up, email is input A's value, password is input B's value. Then email confirmation page, we'll just call this confirmation. There we go. And let's just preview this and see what it does. Okay. Hi, Nick Wanda. It's nice to meet you. We have a new visitor. Let's see here. Okay. Oh, don't like me. Let's do this one. See, it just puts this in here. Okay. So I'm going to click here to confirm my email address. And then now I'm logged in. So, okay. So, okay. if I wanted to put on the confirmation page, what I could do is I could say, um, 
and I don't think it matters which page you put them on, right? So I could say here, um, on page load, navigate, go, not, go to page, and then I can say whatever my destination is. Like I can say for this kind of user, only when current users, something or other, like role is app admin. Mm -mm. And then I could do another one here. I'm going to go to a different page when current users role is something else. Right. Okay. And it automatically, so it is sending them to the confirmation page, but then it load the other page. Right. Back. Exactly. So this okay, is, exactly. this is like a, um, it's almost like a switchboard. It's just a blank page, but they won't eat, they'll hardly see it because they'll get on it and it'll immediately be routed right. somewhere else. Okay. Got it. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Let's see here. We have Nakwanda. Did you have a question for today? No, no yet. No, you're just hanging out. Okay. Yeah. And then um, June, did you have a question? I saw you just pop in as well. Uh, no, just popping back. Nope, just watching. Okay. All right, I think that takes me back to Thomas. Do you have a question? Just bouncing back and forth, aren't you? I don't. No, that's okay. Reese, did you have a question? <laughs> um, just a small one. I can't really provide a visual picture of this, but how do you deal with, um, if you've got a group and you've got text in the group and the the text gets pushed down and it sort of breaks the dimensions of the of the group. Mm -hmm. So I noticed tonight that this, I mean, there's so many, there's so many different mobile phones with different resolutions. Um, and some of them were for some reason pushing text in weird locations and it was just breaking sort of the, the header. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wondering, how to fix that. So the, so I guess you'd create the different break points, right? So um, you just go into your responsive and in this case, I have to go back because this is, right, it's like, you're just looking at the responsive mode and when you see that it's, it's going to break and this can be like your minimum or whatever. You no, just... so, it, so the thing is, is um, I've tested it in the responsive and it's not breaking at any level uh, in the responsive editor or in um, uh, on a mobile phone. It's only specific phones that cause it to break. I, I mean, I don't know that you can do much. I know Callum sort of suffered. Thomas, I don't know if you know your camera's on, um, but Callum kind of suffered. Oh, look, this is our countdown thing that oh, we still did. Counting. <laughs> still counting. <laughs> so let's see here. If I if I inspect the page, I can kind of look at what different phones will be. There are other services that allow you to do that. But the truth of the matter is, is if you have, if it's breaking on certain phones, you can't account. I just don't think you're going to be able to account for everything. You can account for several major things, but I don't think it's worth, to me, it's not worth trying to fix it for everything. So do, yeah. Yeah. Callum did spend a couple of weeks on this problem <laughs> for his <laughs> rating. So, <laughs> how, how did he end uh, up? Did he, did he solve most of it? Um, yeah, I think he was happy, happy with the results that he ended up getting from it, but he, <laughs> it was a couple of different hacks around things, but I mean, essentially, I don't, I don't know that I've had to worry about it too much in, in canvas. Like just if you're building responsively, then it should be handling everything. So yeah. Uh, 
Callum has the advantage that he doesn't expect people to be using his app outside of the mobile interface. So all he was taking into account for were different mobile interfaces. So well, that yeah, I mean that's kind of where I'm at at the moment as well. I don't expect anybody to be using because I've got the I've got the PC side sorted, you know, uh, for larger resolutions. But there's just so much variation in different phones and what people have here that it's it's sort of yeah yeah. I'm sorry, it's not a, a better answer. I think responsive is really the only, like if you've already built it to be responsive, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress too much about it. I guess if, okay. you know, half of your user base is on a particular phone, then you could design for that and to make sure that you're accommodating that one phone screen. Yeah. But other than, go, other than going by like screen size, I don't know what else you would do. Mm -hmm. okay yeah I'll, I'll have to look uh yeah look into the resolutions and see what i can do yep i'm like intentionally putting off doing responsive on the app i'm working on because this whatever this thing flexbox will come out soon i'm just like come on guys i mean you think <laughs> how long is it going to take me to adjust you know to do my responsiveness today versus yeah. waiting an indefinite amount of time like is it going to be next week That's true. you know what i mean yeah no, and, and your site is you know i mean it's going to be everything's a pain to make responsive but you don't have a lot of stuff on those pages no i don't that, that is a nice part but it's just like one less yeah i guess it's just and the other yeah. thing you might think about doing just because you're looking for an intermediate solution is designing a kind of a different mobile interface that's 320 wide and comes down 80% or whatever 280 is. And yeah, then you just have that only display if current page width is below 320. Because that'd be super easy to do. Yeah. I just, you know, getting started on something only to figure out that. There's always one more thing sure. like I want to figure out, but you know, it's like there's so much. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I want to get the smiley search figured out though. Yeah, I, I want you to too. And I want you to hold my hand and walk me through it. Yeah, I'm just gonna yeah, I'm just gonna do it. I have the fortunate ability of I will ask until I get the answer. <laughs> so awesome. I will smiley search. <laughs> Persistence. We love it. Very cool. All right, who else has a question? I do. Okay, go for it, Jay. Okay, so um, let me share, let me find my, uh, right there. Okay, so this is about sending reminders out. Um, after we spoke about this last week, I did a few things to make it prepare for what I need to do. So before I had, I'm, I'm still kind of up in the air about this. I've got this database called tasks. Tasks have notes, you know, like what you want to do is you want, you know, you can make yourself a note and then they have a reminder date and they have a, um, they have a reminder date and then they're either user generated or system generated. Mm -hmm. uh, wait a minute, that's old. Never mind that. So they have a date and they have a note. Um, I also, I think this is just confusing. I have notes which is a note that doesn't have a reminder date. And that's kind of more like a journal for things for your garden. I'm really not, not happy about the way these are because they're so similar. Okay, but getting back to tasks, these are the reminders. So I'm calling them tasks, but they are reminders. So then I built um, uh, a database of first and last frost by zone. Very straightforward. So what I want to do, of course, is every like week or whatever, uh, I want Bubble to find uh, every user who has a certain plant in a certain zone six weeks before first frost or whatever, and then send a message. Does that make sense? Yeah. So okay. each, each user is going to be um, is going to have a reference to the um, frost date based on their zone, their specific zone, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. 
All right. So, so yeah. well, so each user is going to have a zone, and each zone is going to have frost states. Exactly. Okay. So, and so jumps, then you're yeah. going to search your database every every day, or every week. You said. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but let's say every week. Okay, every week, you're going to search the database for. Um, Does which users have a hydrangea? And and are in zone whatever, which is six weeks before, till last frost. Got it. Six weeks to last frost, or six weeks to uh, first, first frost, or six weeks. Well, it's going to be different for different things, but let's say for this example, six weeks before first frost. Okay, so just make a. I'm sorry, yeah, first before last frost, spring. I'm thinking spring. <laughs> spring okay well so i mean how many zones are there 11 in the u.s four in australia i don't know a couple in the uk a bunch in europe all right right so, now i'm only paying attention to the u.s and then later australia all right can i take over mm -hmm. it'll be easier for me to think it through So if I go, garden green. A new API workflow. This will be um, before first frost or before last frost? Before last. Before last frost. Okay. And we're going to have a zoom. You have a zone thing, right? Uh, then no, they're in the user. Well, and yeah, you do. You have the, the zone. Yeah, they're they're in the um, uh, frost state, which is a data type. Right. I don't think we're going to do this as a, like, I don't, it'll be a recursive workflow, but I don't think it's a recursive workflow that needs to run every day. No. I think it's, it's something that we're going to schedule per zone because there's really not that many, 11 in the U.S. So 15 to start 15. with, no, there can't be more than 50 around the world. Right. So... So let's just focus here. So this is just in a, like, you're not sending emails. You're just doing the alert and the, and the. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to work on sending it as a text later, but I don't really care about that yet. So then we don't even really need the API workflow. We just need some conditions to be true. Can you uh, explain a little bit like when you use an API workflow on, on your own app, I don't really understand that. So an API workflow is something that you have to do when the, that's not related to the user being on the site doing something in particular. Yeah. So it's a reaction to something and the user is not currently using the app or regardless of whether the user happens to be doing something on the app or not, yeah. right? So it's, it's for scheduling things. But if you're talking about looking for the date of something, right? So the thing that we might do is we might set, set, set the dates of something. So zone um, here, and then what we could do is we could come in here and make changes to the zone. 
make changes to zone. It should here. It should oh, a zone is a is an option set. No, it's um, it's a field in a data type. No, there's it must be an option set. Oh, it's probably it's, an option set as well. I haven't. I don't know if I'm using that. I have to go through those. Yeah, it is. It's go. an option set. So, like, you might put this. I I might take this and and put it as a as its own data type. It definitely needs its own data type. The reason being is because you're going to set not just the the way people uses dates. It's like the whole date and not just the month, right? And day, it's like the whole date. So you would have a zone thing in the database. And then what you would do is you would just refer to that zone, make changes to that zone, and then change like the date might be six weeks before the last, the last frost this year, right? Is 2021 and then six weeks before last for us next year's 2022 and so after you like after that date passes you're going to come in here and you're going to update it till next year right because that's the thing that in the database that needs to change the if you're not sending out specific emails or text reminders you just want an in-app like to notify them, hey, it's between like it's between six weeks before the last frost date and the frost date, the last frost date, and you just want them to know that, you can set up an alert for that, like in the app, but you don't need to, you don't have to do that here. You could, you could say create a new thing and it could be an alert, right? And then you can say whatever you want in the alert and then you could set it up in the app to look for all of their alerts that haven't been dismissed. When they log in, they can mm -hmm. see a list of their alerts or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you could you could do that in the backend database. There is a data type for zones and frost dates. It's called frost dates. Well, but the yeah, you were just mentioning it, so I'm mentioning it. Well, yeah, but but your frost dates is referring to like in here your oh, where oh I'm in your option sets. So your frost dates is re referring to a zone that's a text, but you have eleven zones or fifteen zones. It should be its own data type. It shouldn't be text. It should be a data type. Okay. Right. So like any any time that multiple things are going to have the same text here, that text should probably be its own data type. Because otherwise, every time you need to change something, you have to go back and change each and every one instead of going to the one thing in the database and changing it there. So like I would have zone as its own data type. And then I would have um, in the backend workflows here, you make changes to that zone to update it every every year to be like the next six weeks to the last frost or something like that, or last frost date or whatever it is. Um, so you, you're ultimately what you're trying to do is you're trying to alert people when they log into the app that they are within six weeks of their their last frost date, right? And also here's what they should be doing. Right, that's a whole other question because that's okay. gonna depend on what's in their beds and, and all of the right. rest, right? right. So, um, but the but the big question here is like how, when, when, I, when Tanya logs into Garden Brain and it's, six weeks to the last frost date here in Arizona is probably December 1st. Um, <laughs> we have, well, our winter is not that long. Um, but but if, if you want me to be alerted and how long do you want that alert to last? Do you want it to persist forever? 
until I dismiss it? Or do you want it to like, just, is it no longer relevant after three weeks if I haven't done anything? It should persist until they dismiss it. Until they dismiss it. So it's basically a do list. Right. Okay. So here before last frost, we're going to set an alert, right? So we'll create, you said you have a task thing. Uh -huh. Okay, so is that something that is, they're already alerted to you as their tasks? They can set up their own or the um, the ones we're talking about now or the automated ones from the system. Okay, so we would create one for them. And is it called task? Uh, it's called uh, my tasks. There it is, W-I-D-I-G. I mean, whatever that is. Okay, so reminder type, system generated. what's the is this a type reminder or what is it is it text where's the text that is view? there uh it's uh task notes task or task notes. content i'm not sure there you go all right and then frost right and then scheduling this is going to be a different a different workflow. So I'm going to take this reference off and create this one. So I'm trying to think when you click a button, we want to schedule everyone's six week to last frost alert. But I don't want to click a button. Like I want the system to do all of it. You have to click the button once. Like the very first time you have to click the button to get it scheduled is all. Okay. Cause it'll be recursive, right? So schedule. Um, and Let's say date. User. Yeah, probably, because we'll just do this when they first log in the first time. So, schedule alert in here. Or last frost. And now we need to find the users zone. So frost date, right? So the users zone should probably save the frost state. Like we don't need a separate frost state. You mean we don't need a separate frost date data type? We can just put it in when they, you know, when they like when you can just call your yeah. You can repurpose your frost date to a zone data type. Yeah. So and then that the user will have a field that refers to that to that zone users. So instead of the zone field in the user data type being just a text field, it will become a. Um, uh, I don't know what you call it when they're connected. It'll be a list of, or it will be a zone. Right. Okay. So like we would put, we would find it in here, like user zone. But you, for now, for demonstration purposes, you have date first frost and date last frost. Mm -hmm. So like this is how you do it is you would minus, let's see, they have, we have days, months. So it would be like what 1.5? I don't know. Does it take? Yeah, it would be 1.5 it takes, decimals. Yeah. So uh, minus 1.5. So the scheduled date to alert them, which is going to create the task, 
is going to be the date of their last frost minus 1.5. But here's the thing is that date of last frost, that's why you, you want to set it to be a zone, a separate thing in the data type, because you want a recursive workflow that every year goes back and updates this to the next year. Okay. Because otherwise it'll be, yeah, it it'll won't happen, happen again. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And then here, create a new task. Here is a at the end, you scheduled this to happen again. Scheduled date would be current date and time plus one year, uh -huh. or you could refer to uh, current users. You know what I mean? Like you have to figure out how you want that reference. Okay. Probably plus one year is fine. Do the frost dates change? No, they don't. So plus one. And so every year, like once you get the user into this recursive workflow, then it'll create the new task and it'll just keep doing this once a year, that task will mm -hmm. pop up. So I need to put um, my reminders, like it's time to prune the hydrangeas type reminders. They need to go in the task database and just be there as system generated messages. Yeah, so probably I could do without this one. You just have this, this alert here. We could probably simplify this down quite a bit so that it would work for all of it. Um, so we can bring all of it into like, one workflow and you just have different types of alerts and the different, like the alert can have its own message, right? Cause you're going to have more than one alert basically is what I'm saying. Yes. So we want to make it as dynamic and simple as possible. Yeah. So, and then you just need to schedule it. Like if it's on a yearly thing, any, any of the yearly alerts can go into this workflow and you can use dynamic inputs to kind of differentiate. So anything that needs to be done annually could go in this workflow. And then anything that needs to happen more frequently can go in different a different workflow. Okay. Or you could even make that frequency part of the data type, right? So you could say um, for, for my last frost alert, which is a type of alert, the frequency is, is 365 and for my um for for my like i don't know first frost alert and 365 and then for my like some other pruning thing that you have to do might happen you need to do it every three months or something you could put the frequency to 90 instead and then you could just dynamically like how many days current date and time plus days, and then you could refer to that frequency field. Are you following what I'm trying to say? Uh, I understand the frequency. And then when you get down, so then uh, let's say, so I wanted to go to everyone who owns a hydrangea, then I would do it only when current users are my plants, do a search for my plants, uh, uh, plant owner is current user, plant equals hydrangea. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and I'm trying to think if everybody's going to be on the same day, though, maybe it makes more sense to do it, run it recursively once on that day through all of the users. Let me think on it. You got a lot I mean, of complexity to your database, Jay. <laughs> I know. I know. But I don't, I, I've, you know, looked, it's interesting how, as I started out, you know, it was worse, <laughs> but as I've yeah. gone through, there's quite a lot of stuff I've taken out and, uh, and put together, you know, uh, would sort of look aggregated. Um, so it's better than it was. Um, yeah. Part of the problem is my naming conventions are illogical to everyone, but me, I've been trying to go through. And as I go through, I think, well, it's been a couple of weeks. I don't remember. I'm like, why, what is this? Oh, that should be called something much more straightforward. And I've changed them. So I think it's getting better. I am concerned about scalability. 
especially because I was reading, um, I don't know what, something, probably a Facebook uh, post. And they were talking about how um, uh, that the only examples of bubble apps, like the heavily used ones, they were talking about 10,000 users. I am looking to build this well beyond that. I'm, you know, and I'm concerned. I don't want to do this again. <laughs> well, I mean, I think, the, I think the point, so I listened back when I first started with bubble one year ago, I went and found all of the like podcasts I could with the founders. Cause I was trying to figure out, well, how big could you scale a bubble app? And the, the answer is if you do it efficiently, you can scale to several hundred thousands of users according to the founders, right? That's the key word though, is if you build it efficiently, right? Like if you're like, and efficiently for our purposes is as few workflows per second as possible, given all of the users who might be like using the app at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, so uh, I forget which founder it was who said this, but he said, well, you could recreate, like you could do a Twitter clone up to like 200,000 users before you would have to move up off of Bubble. That's saying a lot. If you had 200,000 users using like, like using a Bubble app like Twitter, that's a lot of activity. That's a lot of stuff being created all the time and, and people using the app and that sort of thing. So that's, you know, that's going back in here, really getting clear on all of these con conditions uh, or connections that you're doing and tightening this up as much as possible, tightening your option sets up as much as possible. Um, there's a lot of redundancy in here. I'm sure there's ways to clean it up. Um, but you're also, you have to refactor. There's tech debt as you build. Mm -hmm. Like every, every app goes through, has tech debt that needs to be refactored at some point, right? Like you can get, if, even if you're building it super efficiently, the needs of your users are going to change or you're going to figure them out better over time. And you're going to need to go back and rethink things. And every time you have to go back and rethink things, it's not like starting from scratch. You have to yeah. accommodate whatever's there. So like, you're not going to, you're not going to current scale your current app beyond probably a thousand users before you have to do some sort of major refactoring. But at the point that you have a thousand users, if you haven't figured out how to monetize it, you have to, because you have to be able to afford to go back and do things differently yeah so so my question now is speaking of the theory theoretical two hundred thousand, what if i theoretically jumped on to back end this how much further could i scale i don't i don't know the answer to that yeah my but, question is like we know okay bubbles limitation is this but what happens if they jump onto another well i mean back endless isn't going to save you on workflows God. that you're running with with uh that you're running with bubble so what i'm back endless is moving your database out of bubble but you still have to query a database whether it's bubbles or back endless so and one way to help relieve some of the burden on on the back end, then would be you know continue to rely on and uh, parameters and uh, custom states. So it's the work's getting done in the browser. Yeah, but that breaks at a certain point as well. And mm -hmm. the, like the so going back to Thomas's question about back endless, back endless can save you on workflows because you don't have to do you don't have to do janky things to get the right responses from the database using backendless like there's a way for you to minimize the amount of information you're receiving from backendless in order to get the results that you want from in your in your bubble app on the page right so that was kind of a kind of a not quite accurate answer. You do still have to query the database, but if the database return 
information is better from backend lists, then yeah, you can reduce the number of workflows and on-page um, math and things that Bubble is doing because you just got better information to start with. So I do think back of endless can help in that respect. It will just reduce it. um, it's not the exact answer, but it will reduce some of the heavy weight. It, it can reduce a lot of the heavy weight, right? Because like I was saying the other day, when you query Bubble's database for a data type thing, you can constrain how many records you get back, but you can't restrain which fields on those records you get back. So you might only be looking for the name of a user, but you query the database for Bubbles database for users, and it returns all of the information for each of those users that you get back. Right. And that's a lot of information. It's a lot of extraneous information. Whereas in back endless, you could create a view of the user data type that is only the name and you could query that and only get the names back, which would be a lot faster and a lot less information. So um, I forget what, there was something else that you said, Jay, that was About putting more stuff on in the browser. Um, yeah, would, uh, so, so, No, so you're like, you still have to, you still want to factor it down. Like, like what I was talking about with your backend workflows. Like, I still want to figure out, okay, what's the easiest way to schedule these workflows, the alert workflows? Is it finding all of, you know, doing particular searches of the database, coming up with lists and scheduling recursive workflows to run every day for those users? or is it to go ahead and schedule for each user? But if, if I have 5,000 users in the same zone, I can't send 5,000 emails, like schedule all of them to run at the same time. It makes more sense for me to do a recursive workflow that's gonna take its time to go through and send, like create a new thing per user, mm -hmm. so. Thinking through things like that, because this will work. This will work to an extent, but it'll break pretty quickly because I can just see if you only have 15 zones and you've got 5,000 who are in zone one and you're sending out like all 5,000 tasks are scheduled to happen at exactly the same time, that's going to break. And it's not necessary like from a user point of view, it doesn't matter to them whether they get it on Tuesday or Thursday. You know what I mean? It's no, not No, no. You just run a recursive workflow and you take a nice long break in between. You can put 10 seconds between each one of them. So it only moves your capacity up a little bit. I mean, I was breaking. I don't know what was going on last week, but I was running that recursive workflow that was supposed to get through like 10,000. And I got it to go through like 5,000. Um, at one point without breaking, but then it kept breaking at random points. And it's like, I didn't know if it was breaking because I was asking it to do too much. It wasn't, it wasn't costing too much of the capacity, but it was just breaking. It was like, it was irritating. Um, so you have to be like, to be cognizant when you're asking Bubble to do a lot of things like that. There are maybe better programs for doing lots of data processing. I'm wondering if, um, which is why I'm refactoring that app to do it as the records are created instead of trying to process 10,000 records at the end of a semester. So go ahead, Jay. Um, well, that leads to, I got, two comments or questions, I'm not sure, two random thoughts. So one is about what you just said before I forget it. Could, as, as someone signs up, they give the zone, <clears throat> can it be, well, would it matter like if it's scheduled then? Like put a, uh, you know, a, a, some actions in a workflow as they sign up that says in, if they sign up on October 15th and say in six months, because we know your last, your first, your last frost is whatever, 
then do this, send this message? No, so I think that the answer is, um, is zone, right? And then the zone is of type zone when you, when you yeah. have the type zone, whatever that is, I think we're calling it what frost. First, uh, yeah, that's called frost dates. Frost dates. It doesn't let you search this one. Here we go. So I have a frost date, right? And maybe what I do is I, on the front end, I do a search of frost dates and I send in a list of frost dates here. And then the, the next thing is uh, before last frost. So it does it per zone, right? So this will be per zone, we'll do a different one. So then the search is gonna be here. Um. <laughs> Mm, make changes to a list of things or do a search for. So probably users, list of users. So for my other one here, so zone is going to be a list of Frost. Did I pass it? There you go, frost dates. So I'll pass in a list of frost dates here. And then here I want to schedule the before last frost. And the schedule will be Zone first items, last frost minus 1.5. Yeah. And then zone first item. And then users would be do a search for users um, where the zone because you would have a zone of type zone. Yeah. Equals zone first item. Yeah. Right. And so then you're passing in the list of, you're passing in the zone and the list of users for a specific date and time. Right. So the question is, what is, what's going to trigger this one? Because if I do this search for, users here when I schedule this it'll only contain the users at that point in time so it's almost like I need to schedule um this one at the right time right so I just have to think through it probably not something I just need to sit with for a few minutes and figure it out but like I have to trigger it at the right time because I want to trigger this use these use this search for users on the same date that I'm going to send this out. Because otherwise, if I do it a week before, right, then I have a week's worth of users in that zone that won't get the alert. Right. And then this also over the um, over on the right there'd also need to be a filter wouldn't there because we need to search my plants to find out who's got the type of plant that the alert is relevant to like a hydrangea 
Or yeah, whatever. I'll let you worry about that. Okay. I'm just worried about <laughs> alerting them that there's a the last frost is going to happen in about six weeks, right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, like if that's only relevant to certain users, then yeah, you have to figure out whatever this this search is going to be to contain the right users to get this this alert here that we would put in this one, right? So that's how to think about it. Would it make sense to um, add into like zones, the zones data type that is currently being called frost dates, a list of plants that, well, I don't think that makes sense, but uh, the I'll list going. A list of plants that are relevant, that need things done to them six weeks before, six weeks after, whatever it is. Well, I mean, then you're, you're talking about not even caring about the last, fro the last frost. You're talking about caring about what needs to happen for people who have particular types of plants, which is fine, right? You just have to set up some way of, of consolidating all of that information into a simple workflow that will run. Yeah. Okay. Right. So like if the last frost isn't important, independent of the types of, of plants that you have, then the, my plant needs to have the, like the reminder dates, right? Like whatever yeah. the reminders are that are needed for that plan, it'll have its certain set of reminders. Oops. I think that it makes that I think that that isn't great because um, there's different types of tasks that happen at different parts of times of the year. And I think having the access from the, the user zone, which is connected to a data type of zones, which are connected to, you know, knowing what the first and last, that gives me a lot more flexibility. Yeah, but, I mean, so you still have to think about how you're going to construct all of that, like the searches for it. Yeah. So as long as you can get to a succinct, not necessarily succinct, but distinct set subset of users for that specific alert that all need to happen relatively at the same time, like from the same workflow, Yeah. then you're fine. But like, yeah, you, you just have to simplify it in a way that your brain can hold on to it. <laughs> so it into the workflow. <laughs> I totally understand that. All right. Well, I'm going to mess around with that tonight and tomorrow, and I'll probably have some more questions on Wednesday or next okay. Monday, um, but at Sounds least a little good. further. Thank you so much for your help. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, Brittany. Go for it. Yes, so I was trying to follow along, but I kind of got confused because I was trying to use it in my, you know, for my in your purpose. use case. Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to share my screen and um, I think I got lost along the way. I don't okay. blame you for getting lost. It's a lot of <laughs> I get lost in cheese data. <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to um, send an email if the user hasn't logged in, like in a certain amount of time, I don't know, maybe a week or so, um, so that they can, you know, I can send something, a reminder, hey, log in, uh, post the order, I look for new work orders or whatever. So what I did was I made the API workflow name login reminder and just the login. I don't know if it needs to be text or user. Um, I would, no, it will be text because I want it to be an email. So no, mm -mm. Um, no. So I would send. Um, so in the key part, I would put user of type user. Okay. That was. Good. I know this answer. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> so of type um, user. Type user. Okay. And then I have the email here. Yep. Can't use email. And that's fine. Okay. And then do so my where I got confused. Am I supposed to, to schedule? No, nope. this is oh. not a recursive workflow. So go ahead and delete the step two. Okay. And then what you do is where they log in, go to the workflow where they log in. Okay. And then at the at the end of that, click to add an action. 
Okay. And I will need to schedule the workflow here, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to schedule the API workflow. And then it'll be login, schedule date, current date and time plus seven days. Okay. Oh. user be the current, current user. user. Mm -hmm. And now just go to the back end workflow. And then only when, so for that login, only when current users last login. If you aren't tracking it, we can start tracking it on the other page. Yeah, I'm not tracking it. So how do I? So also in the same workflow where we just were. Okay. The login workflow. When they log in, um, do a do a step before step five. So insert an action. Okay, so your go to pages workflows will have to be put at the end of the, the Behind it. list. Yeah, okay. but after everything. But in the meantime, you'll just make changes to the current user. So make changes. Yep, current user, and the thing, change another field, and then go to the bottom, and then create a new field. Yep. And it'll be date. Okay. And then current date and time. Nope, current date and time. You don't need to add anything to it. Okay. okay. So now you know when they last logged in, that'll change every time they log in. And then if you go to um, <laughs> do you have it so that they that they remember they don't have to log in every time? Um no, I did not set it as well. Wait a minute, I think I did. I think I did. No. Well, I'm not exactly sure to be honest. Go to the login <laughs> one where you log the user in. Yeah, remember me is checked, stay logged in. Okay, that's fine. Um, so some people might get an extra reminder. It's fine. It's not a big deal. Um, so go back to the the other action here. So oh. let's put them in order. Okay. So those need to go to the end. Mm. Yeah. Okay, and then back to the back end workflow. Mm, your hide sign up login pop up still needs to be before. So it needs to be before the go to? Yeah. Okay. There you go. I guess if you have conditions on this, it doesn't matter. All right, so log in and then go to the only win on this login reminder. Okay. Oh, okay. Can we use last login? Logged in. Uh, last logged in um, is, how would we phrase this? User's last logged in is, less than current date minus seven. I think that's how we have to do it. We might have to switch the order around. I'm I can't, not entirely sure. 
Yeah, we have to switch it around. So current date and time. So you clear out everything. Okay. And start with current date and time is greater than users last login yes. okay current day and time is greater than current user last logged in okay. um, no we need to be able current Date and time, I guess current date and time minus seven days is. Okay. I'm thinking, let me think through the logic. Hang on, I'm not, my brain is tired. Um, I've been working since five this morning. Um, Clearly I know how bad it is. <laughs> so current date and time. Let me just physically write this down. You ever have to write something down to like mm -hmm. be able to think through it? Yep. I have my remarkable tablet for that. Mm. I have probably saved a whole, whole rainforest by myself with my remarkable tablet. Assuming they didn't have to cut down trees to power it. So today is one, yeah, so it's greater than, so current date and time minus seven days. Okay, hold on. Let me... uh, this is, does it have a minus on here instead of the no, So just minus, so go back, click days again, days, okay. and, then and then just minus, yeah, seven. Okay. And then it's greater than, so users last log then. Minus seven days. So if I subtract seven days from today, which is the 27th, if the 20th is greater than the last day I logged in. So if I logged in on the 19th mm -hmm. and I scheduled in seven days on the 26th to run this and I get to the 26th and it's greater than the time that they last logged in, mm -hmm. then it's going to go ahead and it's going to send them That's an email. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That works. I was trying to do it while you guys were doing it, since I had that same question. But, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's how you would okay. do it. Thanks. You're welcome. All right. I got to get going pretty soon here. Do we have any last questions? Uh, yeah, I just got a quick one. Um, how do you go about saving the layout of your app data? Um, because I seem to always be be fiddling with the the rows and the columns and everything, but when I leave and and uh, come back, they're all just messed up again. Is there something that I'm missing? I'm not sure I understand what you mean. You so mean in the app back. Data Oh, in app data. Okay, yeah. got it. Oh, yeah. So that's this thing called views. So I'm in J's. I don't want to be in J's. I want to be in mine. Go back here. I 
actually pretty cool how you can save views of your data in Bubble. So let's say for all API calls, I'm here and I'm looking at my data. I've got this and there's one additional field. So maybe tallies would be better. So I say, oh, it's not showing me the, the ones that I really care about, the fields that I really care about. So I come here and I add slug created by an unique ID and I save it. And now I can see all of those things. So now I have all tallies modified and I can actually come in here and I can change this to say tallies all fields. Right, and I can even save, if I wanted to do a search on it, I can say, well, um, like, I only want the ones that were created by like equals a certain day or it's not a certain day, or I can do all kinds of like expressions here to filter it down. And now when I come back in, instead of going to all tallies, I would just go back to this view. So what about uh, resizing each of those columns? Because I've got columns that are far too big and take up too much space. I don't, I don't know that you can. So like if, if I come in here and I say, I want to move this around, like I want to move this over, that's, this is the part that you're talking about. Like I move last week to, to here and I refresh. I don't know that you can save that. Let's see. Yeah, so in that case, for myself personally, if I wanted to see it in a particular way, I would just create an app admin page and I would create the like repeating group and style it exactly as I wanted it to be. Right. Yeah, that's, it's not gonna save any of the changes you make here aren't gonna save beyond refreshing the page. Damn, so. okay. <laughs> Yep. If somebody, if, if I'm wrong and someone knows how, please tell me because that would save everybody a lot of time. But I think, you know, ultimately what I would do is just, I would pop into a page and I'd make the view that I want to see. And I would just go to that page to see it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Anyone else? I just have a question. We don't have to work on it. I just want to know if it's possible. Sure. So with that back end workflow that I was just doing with the emails, mm -hmm. is it possible to send a different email to the uh, different type of user? I say a freelancer, I wanted to send something different in that email yep. rather. Okay. Well, I'll get to it later. <laughs> yep. No. So you could do the exact in the same workflow in your back end workflows, mm -hmm. um, the, where you had like the workflow and it and it said to send this email. You could put uh, only when only when current user is a certain type, and then you can duplicate it and change what you wanted and make only okay. when it's the other type. All right. Easy enough. Thanks. You're welcome. Anyone else? I'm good. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, Naquanda, I, we didn't get to talk. I feel like, I feel like I didn't get to know you like I was planning to today, um, but that's okay. We'll try again next time. We'll be back here tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. Pacific time uh, for office hours. I want to thank Jay, Thomas, Brittany, Naquanda, Reese, and June for being here, and also my Kim. And thank you, everyone. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks for all your help. Bye, You're welcome. Thanks, Bye, Bye. Bye. Bye.